everybody. We are delighted to have you guys here today. Um, so welcome to our Thursday at 3 talk in the Rare Book and Special Collections Division. Uh, we are incredibly excited and honored to be uh, hosting uh, D.A. Mutal at the Library of Congress, uh, speaking to us about his truly extraordinary corpus of work uh, produced at one of the oldest or the oldest etching studio in France. Let's say, we'll say the, we'll go with that. <laughs> uh, so my name is Stephanie Stillo. I am the uh, new chief of the Rare Book and Special Collections Division. Um, I am happily joined today by Mark Divination, who is uh, the former chief of the division and the primary architect uh, of this series, uh, as well as our extensive artist book collection. So uh, if you are looking for someone to Thank for all of us having a space and a time uh, to be here today. Uh, you can definitely throw some praise in that direction. So thank you, Mark, for everything. So I'm going to kick off our talk today uh, with something a little bit personal. Um, when I first arrived in the Rare Book and Special Collections Division about eight years ago, uh, I was naturally uh, and hopefully forgivably a little bit overwhelmed. Uh, by the amount of material we have. The enormity and scope of our division is truly extraordinary, right? And trying to sort of wrap my head around that, it took me a minute, right? And so what I did is I found little islands of comfort in our division, right? Um, I sort of swam uh, into everything from medieval manuscripts to contemporary artist books. And there wasn't a little, there wasn't rhyme or reason I think to, to why I swam from sort of one island to another. But I allowed myself to be drawn to whatever I felt was right. Okay. DDA's work always felt right to me. Whenever I opened the pages of his books, I felt intrigued and excited, and most importantly, in complete and total awe of the artistry and the skill that you see in his work. I am uh, I'm very happy to say that I, that magic has remained for me with DDA's work. Uh, and I have, uh, I, he, he has a special place in my heart. Um, so I am very pleased to be able to share that with you today. Um, to introduce DDA more properly, uh, I am going to hand it over to my friend uh, and colleague, uh, Gerald Cloud, uh, to, to give us just a little bit of introduction uh, of this wonderful art. Uh, thank you, Stephanie, for inviting us, and thank you to the Library of Congress and the uh, Division of Rare Books and Manuscripts and Special Collections. <laughs> so it happens when you try to improvise off of the script. Um, and thank you to Mark and the Library for having a, a long interest in DDA's work. And uh, we're really happy to be here. Um, but first, a word about the Atelier Didier Mutel, which traces its roots to 1793, making it, I believe, the oldest continuous etching studio in France. Uh, from a historical and artistic point of view, the studio represents centuries of knowledge and a very high level of handcraft production. The studio is well recognized in France and abroad for its highly specialized productions, which combine traditional techniques and contemporary innovations. Didier Mutel apprenticed to the studio starting in 1988, joining there his master printer, Pierre Lavier, who ran it from 1968 to 2008. The studio moved from Paris at this time to the Joie, uh, east of Dijon. And after five years of renovation, its grand opening took place in 2014. Didier Mutel has been producing artist books and engravings since 1989. And if you do the math, that makes him a teenager. <laughs> Born in 1971, I was supposed to read that part first. Uh, he, he entered the Ecole Estienne at the age of 15, and then studied at the Ecole Nationale Supérieure des Arts Décoratifs in Paris, and continued his studies at the Atelier National de Création Typographique at the Imprimerie Nationale. From 1997 to 1999, DDA was in residence at the Villa Medici in Rome, where he had a fellowship, a French one, uh, at the, at the, in 
Rome, uh, where he produced two collaborative books. In 2008, the Atelier Georges Leblanc closed, and Pierre Lallier transferred a significant portion of the historical equipment to DDA. In 2009, DDA purchased a space, a space, a giant warehouse in Orchamp, in the Jura, where he reinstalled the workshop. Since 2003, he has been teaching at the Institut Supérieur des Beaux-Arts of Besançon and is regularly invited by American universities and libraries for presentations and special courses. In 2013, Didier received the prestigious title of Maître d'Art. Most recently, he was awarded the Prix Lillian Betancourt for l'intelligence de la main, the, the intelligence of the hands, right? It's a great <laughs> award to win for an engraver, uh, which is a jury prize for exceptional talent that recognized his recent book, R217A, uh, printed in 2016, as a work resulting from a perfect, and I'm quoting, mastery of techniques and savoir faire of artistic craft, as well as demonstrating innovation and contribution to the evolution of this knowledge. His most recent work includes uh, La Pierre Rosette, or the Rosetta Stone, 2015, the monumental The First Atlas of the United States of Acid, 2017, Sidereus Nuncius, 2018, Melancholia, 2021, The True Tales of Captain Acid, 2022, and the ongoing series The Birds of Acid, which started in 2019. So it's my honor to introduce my friend, Didier Mutel. Thanks. And 
I mean, using Instra Instagram, etc. But and it is very quick. As they click, you know, instant, um, instant animals, the other one will get the image. But then, when we engrave, it, we need much more time because first we do not see what we are doing. It's a long process, and then it is reversed. So from the beginning until the point we will get the image, it's a long journey. And also they love this. So to take time is always a big question. Okay. So this is to introduce the studio. I would like to talk a lot about the studio, about the history, what has been done there, what it means, what we, what is the, the goal, the aim of the studio, what is, for who and what, what are we doing there. But oh, too many questions. So I want to focus. <laughs> yes, it's a large panel. What, what was the studio before? What it is today? And, and I think the studio has to be uh, somehow open and of course for the scholar, but it, can, it is also a place where we live, where we share events, we can make also family things. I mean, it has to be very fun and for plenty of generations. So, so now a few slides uh, showing some books which uh, well, I did work on. That one is about Siderius Nutius, which is a Galileo book. He was making this fantastic engraving just by looking at the moon with a very, that very simple lens, and it is very beautiful. So I did make some monotypes for the phases of the moon, and one of the points is that the paper I have chosen is an extremely thin paper, like 30 grams. So here we can see it is almost flying and we have the phases of the moon, and here the transparency. So here are the, all these first slides, just about to talk about materiality, because yes, a lot of things are through computer or cell phone, and here we are very much into that materiality, where we, what we want to share is very important, and the non-verbal, everything we can feel through the elements and the techniques, is very, it is very important. So here we can see a little bit of the light, the light, is very important. Fibers of the paper, thickness of the ink, transparency, all this is extremely important. This is another book which is uh, Newton Principia. So Newton has written three laws and then it, it was becoming one law, le, la loi universelle. And it is a monument from the, in the history of science and I did remodel it, and here it's the it's a bit special because the leaves they are not made out of paper, they are made out of concrete. So if you etch a plate, and if you want to print, because usually that is what we do, uh, and you don't have a press, you can print, for instance, with plaster, and it works perfectly. So it also works with concrete, and here the idea of concrete is like a stone, and it is heavy. But it is as well, it, we can think it is very strong, but those leaves are also very fragile. So there is like not a maximum, but always a tension between what we think, what we expect, and the reality. And because it, it is not flexible, uh, I had to find a way to bind, which was a little bit tricky <laughs> because first I did something, it was working, but then we need really to open it, but not completely flat, otherwise it breaks. That is what did happen with the two first copies. So, it was last week at NYU and we did correct and uh, restore, and now it's perfect. So, um, I would say that the book is always, it is also a collaboration between the artist and also here with the libraries, who is hosting the book. So, that, that relationship is very important and we are all very much into what we are doing, so I need a lot of time in the studio, but sometimes it's good that we can meet and talk. That is what is happening today. So here, the restoration of the Newton, and here is the Newton. It's concrete, with all the proofs and the broken leaves. Okay. And that one is a little, another one, the title is Air 217A. It means the resolution 217A from the United Nations. So it is a text which has been signed in 1948 in Paris, so after World War II, to reaffirm the Declaration of the Human Rights. And the, the one from the French Revolution, 
it was two centuries ago. But that one is really dealing with all the subjects around us, including education, holiday, etc. Trying to what do we need for a better society and social relationship, etc. Et so there are 30 articles and it, it's a beautiful text. So the idea with that text, I did print on, with a white ink on a white paper and depending on the light, sometimes we can see the text and sometimes it disappears. The idea is to say that it is not because we cannot see something, it does not exist. And oh, yes, it exists. And in between every leaf, white leaf, there is a carbon paper. So the idea is to transmission and to, to, to make more copies, of course, with the carbon. But also when we turn the pages, we can take a little bit of the ink on our finger. And the idea is we took, we, we took something from the book, physically, and we bring it somewhere else. So here is a binding, and it is housed in a box made out of Korean. And the Korean is like marble, a white stone, and Okay, it is a very nice in introduction. The box is always very important as, as it is the first visual contact we have with the book. Yeah. Right. And here we see the light on the white paper and the binding. Okay. And here it is after the book, I have made two portfolios, and one of the portfolios is printed on a Japanese paper with synthetic fibers and when you emboss that paper with warmth it is melting somehow and then becoming translucent. So here the idea is light revealing the text. So when the, my hand is behind we can see how it works. And this is a Korean box. So this is uh, it for the, I would say, the first chapter, which is about the materiality. And of course, today, I mean, the book was there to, to carry uh, the content messages. But of course, with the artist book, we try to go as far as we can with that architecture and the materials. And, and that's it. So the materiality is extremely important. And now I'm going to show you the United States of acid. I am always talking about acid because as an etcher, I'm using acid to engrave and to bite the plate. So acid is also the metaphor of creation. So here there is that atlas. You can see the box. And when we open the box, there is the gold inside. And then there is a title page saying that it is the first atlas of the United States of acid by T.K. Mutter. I define myself as an artist and geographer and engraver under the supervision of, yes, friends, Manet, Goya, Bonbon, Durel, Duvet, Montaigne, Piranes, Calo, Segers, and Lallier, the X-Men of the etching world. And he chose the 50 states of the United States of Acid, and also the representatives and the senators. So we we'll see. And then there is a dedicate, so, which is saying, my acid is for you, it's a lot later. <laughs> but here we go through it. Here we go through it. And, you know, there are things we can read and things more. But I, I love it. And then we have the, the state. So um, we have the, the state. So we can see Alabama seed. And when we have line, it means a representative. And when we have a cross, it is for the senators. So two senators for one state. And as many representatives depending on the population. And of course, I have changed all names. So for the lower chamber, uh, the representative, they are artists. So here we have Carl André and Merci Cunningham, but also Marcel Proust and Villon, and Lorenzo Di Berti from the Renaissance. So it's like the whole family of the artists, so the age can be from the mathematic or visual or writer, composer. Okay, a very nice family. So this is the lower chamber. And uh, for the Senate, I have taken some uh, super heroes. So here we have, I don't know exactly who is, who is Kilo Ward, but a super hero. And here we have so the North Carolina. And the interesting part for me was also the marginalias, because we have the shape of the state, but all around 
the marginalia was a, a space for me to express from the graphic point of view. So many things are happening in the marginalia. So we Colorado with Lucien Freud, Anton Fleming, Emil Zola, Victor Hugo, Mazo Finiguera, you know, the guy who invented how to print the etchings in 1452, etc. So here we have views. And when we put all these elements together, it makes a very, very big map of the United States of Brazil. And when I present this to the children, for instance, they understand how it how it goes. I mean, you have two chambers and, and another, two different logic. So, from the visual point of view, it works. Here we have this very, very tiny, so with a lot of space all around Rhode Island. And here we have Texas, which is very big, so we need two plates which are extremely big. And at the very low, uh, you can see there is one empty space, like for the salt unknown artist, and at the very low we have also Homer Simpson as a representative <laughs> of Texas. Can you say that name again? It's just perfect in French. Hmm? Could you say that last name again? Uh, Homer Simpson? Yeah. <laughs> representative of Texas. <laughs> yes. So, the Vermont. So, all the states are there. Hawaii. Okay, and then the colorful. Now, I have that engraving, which is about one meter by one meter. We can probably recognize the Rosetta Stone, which is in the British Museum in London. So, my is really exactly as the original, but I changed the three levels. It is the same proportion, the same number of letters, but if we look at the very top, at, uh, at the very beginning, we can see names of artists. So the first one is Francesco Goya, and the second one is Villon. I designed typeface, and it looks a little bit like hieroglyph, but it's a really Latin typeface. So in the first part, we have name of artists. So it's a little bit the following of the Atlas of the United States, a tribute to artists. So. Paul Ayolo from the Renaissance, Okuza, well, people I like, and, okay, a list of artists. In the middle, we have not the artists, but what the artists have done, the title of the works. So, for instance, if we <coughs> start with Goya, we have Caprice, Désastre, et Proverbe, which are the three main series of Goya's etching. And at the very bottom, with another typeface, so I will create three typefaces for this, it is what means uh, creation, which I don't know, I have done my best to explain, but <laughs> it's very difficult. So my Rosetta Stone, the original Rosetta Stone is such a strong symbol because it was the key to enter the uh, Egyptian civilization. Mine is a key to enter, I would say, artistic creation. So here we can see some detail, details, the three typefaces. And for one copy of the Rosetta Stone, I did print on an extremely thin Japanese paper, which is translucent, and I did glue it on a fake marble, but which can become translucent. So it is like this, and when we put some light on behind, uh, it becomes really, really <coughs> and there is kind of magic when a stone becomes translucent. So, and I have done, and now maybe it's time to switch because there is a small movie, not really a slideshow, to explain because I said they are artists and they work.
Schwartz list? Yeah. People you greatly admire? Yes, there are like part of the Pantheon, but it's part of the Pantheon. There are many other. At some point, you have to make a choice, and uh, it was very quick. Uh, maybe in, I don't know, in an afternoon, I was just making a list. And if today I would make a list, it would be another list. But truly, those people, those people say, I love them. <laughs> and now I'm going to show you this work, which uh, there is, uh, we all know the Bird of America, which I love very much. It's extremely spectacular. And I have like with a deep connection with birds, and I've been working on birds during more than ten years, and then I didn't forget the birds, but then I came back into it. So to make it extremely short, birds are like a metaphor for me of artists. They can fly, they can travel, they can okay, birds. We can. They are artists. So I was willing to to make another version of the birds of America, and it became birds of acid, of course always the acid, it means the art, the artist. So here I have taken the original title page, I changed the, the typography, the design, but it is exactly as the original. So saying that birds of acid from original drawings, very limited, artist, geographer, and engraver, and then a small mistake, which is, I don't know if it is a mistake, because it is written fellow of any Royal Society. I was thinking I was not part of the Royal Society because my English is not that good. I became a <laughs> fellow of any Royal Society. <laughs> so good. <laughs> now it's done. Of, in London of, and Edinburgh, founder of Acid Airline, and it is published in auction. So this is the title page. And I, I like that title page so much that I made some other interpretations and variations on that title page. So there would be like one book full of title page with chromatic variations. So here we have the birds of acid, birds of light. Here we original drawings, original drawings. Today, yesterday, tomorrow. And then there is a text. I written a, ste a text saying what they are for me, what is the purpose. And the text is in French and in English, saying that what I am looking, what I am looking for, does not exist. So I'm looking for something. We say artist, we find a little bit of it, and we continue the journey, looking for something unsubstantial, unsubstantial. So we have all these pages, and now in English, and then we have some of the artists. So they are serigraphed. It's about the same size as the original Côte du Bon, bright colors, and it goes, it is again like a list, the pantheon of artists. He is my master. Polagolo and Calo. So this book will, is on and will still have <coughs> for uh, maybe seven or eight years. It is not unusual that the book is asking for five or ten years. We need time. It is not really a problem, but we have to adjust and to find that time. But we need time to produce big projects. She lost one of her sons during the First World War could not recover from that disaster. So we have that little yeah. yes. And now I would like to talk a little bit with this book, which is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which uh, I did print this book off in 94, so it was a long time ago. But still today, it is very important. And we are going to turn the pages, but after we have the chance to copy it over there, so it will be, we will be able to, to, to see it in a much better way. Anyhow, so it starts, we all know the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This is the title. And here in the title, we almost can see the most important point of it, which is the typography and the way it has been uh, 
done because here it's not like typo typography. But then we have the preface with images and here we have the mask because of the question of the identity and the mask is going to turn and as it is going to turn it is going to change from Dr. Jekyll into Mr. Hyde. So it's like the story before the story and this is the only place where we will have images. And I did this book in English and also in French, they both goes together. So if we go through the French one, we have the other part of the revolution. And now we have the beginning of the text. So Mr. Utterson, the lawyer, and it starts like this. And there is nothing special. But at the end of the first chapter, for the first time, we do hear about Mr. Hyde. And for the first time, we have a world bigger than the other. And that is the key of the book, because from that point, here it is. From that point, we will hear more and more about Mr. Hyde. So the second chapter is search for Mr. Hyde. So Jekyll will search for Mr. Hyde, will find Mr. Hyde, and Mr. Hyde will start to exist and to grow. Until the point that the Dr. Jekyll is going to lose the control of the metamorphosis, a big, big problem because Hyde is going to be stronger and stronger, a little bit like a disease. And at the very end, the last chapter is the full case of Henry Jekyll by himself. So the last chapter it is I was born, I went to school, I did this, I, I, I. That is. And at the, for some copies, I have uh, variations, which is about the question, always about the question of identity. Okay, and I have it in French, the same. So here we have the title, and then we have the portrait, but instead of being in front of the mask, we are behind the mask. So, and it is going to change from Dr. Jekyll into Mr. Hyde. Here we have Mr. Hyde facing Dr. Jekyll. And here, it is interesting to see that with the French version, we have the same, num same number of pages, same ideas, but in fact the text has another color. So, another vibration. So French and English are different. So the one important thing is that the idea of this book is to make a typographic transposition of Jekyll and Hyde duality into a text image duality. So we can see that the typography is expressing this eye growing and growing. And I want to see some typographer to see if we could do this with lead typography because then I was working with lead typography for the text. And it was not really possible, so we had to find another way. And uh, the point is that uh, I did make uh, the graphic design with, uh, it was in 91, that was brand new, the Macintosh. And then I was able to, to, to do something like this. And after the, the, the graphic design was set, I came back on copper plate and I did etch the text with a photo process. And in fact, I would say that the, maybe the main idea is not to show what it happened with Jekyll and Hyde, but in that book I could make the connection between brand new techniques and the very old traditional way to, to, <coughs> to do books, which is still today at the very heart of the research, which is what does it mean today with the, those very old tools and the connection between what was made before and us today. And that connection between us and what was before is extremely important. So, there is always something here. Okay, this book is showing a story, and there, there is another meaning beyond. So we have longer lines, and then here it is a, a letter. So the typeface is the Bascardier, very British, and here we have the Italy, which is very beautiful. <coughs> and now we are very close from the point. It's going to be very difficult to go through. At that point, it's done. We cannot go through the text. There is no more text anymore. That is where we have the last chapter. And with the English version, it's interesting because the I is like a column, very abstract, very beautiful. But in French, the G like this is more disappointing. I mean, the shape is not that perfect. But with the French, I could do something else because there is a G of the G, I, but the G is like the G of Jekyll. I and Jekyll, it is the same letter. 
therefore, and I took also the H, because H does work for Henry, Henry Jekyll, and Henry Jekyll and I. And Stevenson did play with this. So the French is a little bit different because I could play with, with this. And again, some more variations. Thank you. Here it is for the. And I think now, if we have time, we can go through the originals. And that would be fantastic to see. Great. Well, let us. So someone will like uh, this kind of modern. 
and jazz or very classical or punk music. So we will all interpret the same paper but very different. And a, a plate of copper we can do. So I have slight variations depending on I don't know what. <laughs> depending on the <laughs> source. The Rosetta Stone is a single sheet. Yes, yes. And so how do you publish it? Just as a sheet? Or yes. Is it in a box? No, as a um, in an image such as this, yes. are you sketching on paper and transferring that sketch photomechanically onto your plate, or are you actually sketching on your plate? I do sketch on the plate. Mm -hmm. so there is, yeah, usually, I mean, that uh, technique of aquaphotics does work so well. I mean, you have your copper plate, then you choose what kind of varnish, what kind of ground on top of it because it can be very hard or very tender, very dure or very new, and from that point it's working so well. Uh, well I'm not discovering it. I mean, we are doing it since ages, I think, centuries. It works perfectly. So you've mastered the, the calligraphic uh, representation of type? Mm hmm Because that's what you have going on here. And you're doing that freehand on your plate. Yes, and we have to take care because uh, it is reversed. Yeah. So, but it's not that because when you make calligraphy like this, it's not like a writing. Yeah. There are shapes like drawing, so your your brain is not working the same way. Yeah, I don't think your brain works the same way. <laughs> <laughs> so, Didier, we did have a question um, that came in online. We are not live streaming. These are questions that came in just at the announcement of this talk. Um, so, do you uh, use any non-toxic grounds for etching, and would you recommend any non-toxic grounds? When, when I use the ground, I think there is two I really love. They are solid mm -hmm. at the beginning. Because you, you can have some, they are liquid. Mm -hmm. And I love the solid, so you need to warm the plate a little bit. And now, when I used to, to be um, 86, that is the way I did lamb. And still today, I think it is the best one. Mm -hmm. Because it is rather quick. Well, you need to practice it very little bit. But after a couple of hours, it seems OK. And then I think it is very safe, very quick, and there is not a lot of smokes, and yeah. so it's very good. So I love the hard ground. Hard ground. Okay. Yeah. We, you warm the plate, and then it is melting on the plate, and mm -hmm. you mix this, and then you fume it, mm -hmm. and it, is, it gives you such a very deep black. Mm -hmm. So when you work just with a very tiny point, you can see extremely precisely what you are doing. If you do it with a brush, then you will need like two hours for it to be dry, and then it smells terrible. Yeah. So I really prefer <laughs> the, the apples. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Yeah. I was wondering about the dinosaur portraits of various artists like mm -hmm. Manet and mm -hmm. Corbett and so forth. Are they? Is that your art? Yes. So dinosaurs. Uh, I am seeing birds, and I show dinosaurs. Okay, for me they are sense family. Okay, now we know this. And <laughs> so why dinosaurs? Well, the shapes they are extremely strong and joyful, and the colors are very bright. So do I say that artists are dinosaurs? No, it's not exactly that clear. <laughs> uh, but okay, I got that shape of the dinosaur, which is a very big, on the very large page because the Audubon is a double elephant. And I have taken the French paper, which is about the same, a tiny little bit smaller. And the name of the French the size is very different because in, in England they call it the double elephant, which is why and we call it colombier, which is the colomb is a pigeon. No, very different <laughs> name for the same size. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Any other questions before we wrap it up? We definitely want to leave plenty. We'll go ahead and end with you, but we do want to leave plenty of time for you. Uh, to take a look at the images on the table. The, the screen is lovely and the resolution is certainly the best that we can do, but there is nothing like getting to see these in real life. So, uh, yes, ma'am, last question. Well, I've kept thinking about the fact that being able to print many, many, many pages, many, many books uh, was the great thing that happened to our culture. And you seem to be not too interested in making
mass production, you are playing around with things. And I'm also curious, when I did any etching, it was coating the plate with some wax, I think it was, and then you cut, cut through it so that the acid can eat mm -hmm. the lime. And I don't know that you're working that way at all. I, I don't know how you, what your method is. This is exactly, I mean, the aquifer is would either that works or that the ground on top of the plate, you know, for instance, the Rosetta Stone, that, that was a big plate, and I spent so many times scratching, doing exactly. But then how do you get, you had type sometimes that looked like usual printing type, and then other times it was hand-drawn, obviously, and you seem to favor some really peculiar styles. Um, and so I was just surprised, you know, I, this is a, what I've known. And so this is a whole brand new thing. Um, so, and I, I was particularly interested in the pages where there was type that was set pretty in a regular way, but then it looked like you drew over it larger letters that were very nicely drawn. They weren't... Um, with taking? With with stroke. Well, it was pages with text and... Starting by Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah. yeah, so Jekyll and Hyde, it was a combination to, uh, between the computer and then I went through transparent. So thin. how does a computer get into this? Me? For the all the letters, big and small, behind or beyond. So I mean, you play around thing. on the computer screen and get what you want. Yes. And then there's some way that the computer yes. makes something that you Exactly. Can, I see. Okay, this is all... That is a point. Wild I wild. went from the computer to the aqua tortoise. And if I look at the transparent, transparent pages, mm -hmm. they really do not like in the book. I could not um, uh, do the book without the computer, but the book really does not look what was on the screen. So we reached something very specific. Okay. And we do have that book out for you to take a look at, and um, we have several pages, and I, and I think that that will help getting sort of a good, nice close up of it. Yes, yes, yeah. because we will see that, oh sorry, that for instance, at the beginning, first pages, uh, Dr. Jekyll is talking, and the letters are small, like 12 or 40, and then they will grow and grow, and because they are hidden into the, the copper plate, from a certain point, when you wipe the plate, when you print, uh, the ink cannot stay on the walls okay. inside the letter. So we, we start to have what we say crevé. Okay. And by this, until a certain point, it means that Jekyll uh, I is going to have his own visual identity, both mm -hmm. characters. So black letters are somehow for Jekyll and empty letters for I. Mm -hmm. And this just can be done with this technical. Thank you.